Hello, DerbyCon. So uh, I like to start it off with this slide because this is a little introduction. This is this is one of the things I feel like when I'm at DerbyCon. You know, we're we're you know we're going to break into your network and destroy you and stuff, but we're going to do it in a nice, gentle way. You know, because we're we're the good guys. So I thought that, that's a really good back echo there. Is there an AV guy that can work on that? Should I walk out that way? Okay, we're just going to go as we go along. Uh, so yeah, so that's, that's the reason why I put that in there. It's just a nice little intro slide as everybody's waiting to come in and get me started. This is the talk, secure the internet. Uh, getting, it, uh, getting it wrong is easy. How do I do it right? You're securing the internet, you're doing it wrong. Um, basically, this is not a regular run-of-the-mill talk. It's a rant that I cleverly disguised as a 45-minute talk. So uh, please understand when I'm screaming and lambasting you guys, I'm not lambasting you. These are all, you know, all on me. It's just one of the ways that I roll because basically the only thing you need to know about me is that every single mistake that I talk about in this talk, I've done. I've done all of them. It's like this is not something, you know, that I'm directing towards you. This is things that I'm talking about that I've made and hopefully you can learn from some of my mistakes. Also, the other thing you need to know is like I'm a defense guy primarily. It's like I like defense. I like infrastructure. I've always wanted to be able to do a defensive talk and actually have people, you know, want to hear it. Um, case in point, this is a slide from 2005 where I was giving talks at uh, colleges and stuff, you know, in small little local areas, uh, giving a talk called Selling Elephant Whistles, How to Get Upper Management Buy into the Security Process. Uh, it was called Selling Elephant Whistles because obviously, you know, I like weird titles, but uh, also it was based off of a really bad joke. And it's, the joke was, you know, a guy's walking down the street and he sees this man with a shoe box and it says, Elephant Whistles, $20. Guy goes over to the, to the man and he's just like, why would I spend $20 on a cheap plastic whistle from a shoe box? And the guy goes, how far do I have to stand away for that echo not to be there? It's like, so y'all can still hear me? Because I'm loud? Okay, good. So the, uh, so the guy's is like, well, these aren't just cheap plastic whistles. These are elephant whistles. The, the tone and the pitch and stuff, you know, drives elephants mad. They won't, if they start uh, stampeding, they'll stop. It's like they, they can't stand the sound of it. You won't find an elephant within a 10 mile radius of one of these whistles. And the guy goes and says, well, how do I know it's working? And the man looks around and says, do you see any elephants? <laughs> I stated it was a bad joke at the beginning, so no groans there, okay? It's like, but that's what we do with management, don't we? Every year, at the end of the year, we go and say, hey, we need another, you know, couple hundred thousand dollars and stuff, you know, for our, our, our security program. We need another million dollars for this blinky light machine and stuff, you know? And they're like, well, why? I says, well, did you see all the stuff that didn't happen last year? Okay, well, if you don't want none of that other stuff to happen next year, we need all that money. It's like that movie, The Recruit and stuff, you know? Your successes are secret, your failures are public. So how do we prove the negative? And that's one of the things that we have problems with. And so I gave a talk like this, and I was actually told back in 2005 and stuff, you know, it's like I, when I tried to submit this to conferences and stuff, they were like, yeah, we don't do defensive talks, next. And so it's like, and so I started, you know, doing offensive talks because I liked, you know, going to conferences and stuff, you know, and, and being awkwardly hugged by people. And so, uh, but now it's like I got to the point where it's like I got to, you know, slip this in this year, and it's been awesome because it's like this is one of my passions is getting this kind of stuff out there. The other thing is, like I said, I'm ranty. So I decided if I'm going to be screaming at you and telling you all the things that we're doing wrong in the industry, you might as well have something funny to look at on the slide. So it's like I'm doing most of these slide decks are in memes. Uh, also, dual course should get a shout out because it's like I saw his and that gave me, and this was at DerbyCon, and I'm so glad that I'm speaking at DerbyCon again because it's like last year, this is when it started getting formed, this whole idea of doing this talk. It's like because of the awesomeness that was there uh, last year. And so Another thing about memes that ties in closely to information security is that just like a meme, we go, you know, 5,000 different ways to say something on the same kind of variant of a meme. You know, it's like everybody's trying to figure out another way to say, you know, patch your system. Everybody's coming up with different kinds of ways and stuff, you know, saying, you know, Java may not be the securest thing out there. So, so you know, it's like, so, so we keep trying to, so just like memes, we keep trying to come up and say the same thing. Now let's get into the actual details of what we're talking about at first. The first thing I'm going to talk about is how do we get upper management by the security place? How do we get CIOs and CEOs to listen? One of the things that we have to change 
is how we perceive upper management. That's one of our problems. Saying that our boss is the pointy haired guy from Dilbert, saying that uh, things aren't working out, saying that uh, well, they just don't get it, that's a crutch we use so we don't have to actually pay attention and we don't actually have to give it all and stuff, you know, to make sure they understand. We're using that, saying that upper management's not going to understand, upper management doesn't get the process, as a way to be able to write them off. That's not going to work. If your upper management doesn't understand the problem, then you need to find a way to communicate that to them so they understand that problem. Because you're never going to succeed. You're going to keep hitting your head on the same thing. You're still going to be going, wow, why are we still letting that through our firewall? Have you understood and explained that so the CEOs understood that shouldn't happen? That's what we got to start working on. That's when it starts getting quieter. It's like, oh, he is ranting at us. It's like, but yeah, that's what happens. One of the things that, and I got a couple of things that we need to start doing to help with this. One of the things that we like to do is I like to think, uh, create something called situational awareness with our, with our management. I like to make sure that our management has security awareness unto themselves, a certain form of security awareness, where they understand what kind of situations are going on. Uh, there was a great uh, example of this, not the best example, but a, a great example uh, of how this occurs, where um, I just started this job at this financial place, and I'd just only been there for like a year, I think, or, or no, actually it was about four or five months, crap. So it's like I go there, and the CIO comes to me, for the record, and officially, this was not my idea. And the CIO comes to me, he's like, Jason, this is going to be a great idea. I want to play a practical joke on April Fool's joke, because April Fool's was coming up, to the president of the company, the CEO president of the company. Why don't you create a phishing website and stuff, you know, uh, create a, like a site that they're trying to fish our data, and then uh, send an email and say, you know, to the president on April Fool's Day, showing that, they, they were getting, uh, that, that we were getting fished. That'll be a hoot. And I'm like, okay. He totally didn't understand exactly how dedicated I am to detail. I created a phishing website, totally scraped our website, had all the content on my server, had an iframe inside one of the windows and stuff, you know, where you could actually log in and put in your, your account information and stuff, you know, that didn't go anywhere, but it looked like it was legit. And then I, well, not legit, legit, but you know, it looked like a legit phishing page. <laughs> then I created a separate email address and I created as a uh, Lieutenant Colonel James O'Neill and stuff, you know, an 82-year-old retired Air Force guy, because I was watching Stargate at the time, who sent an email <laughs> to the president forwarding an actual phishing email that I created with the Earl to that website saying that it's like I nearly got bamboozled out of all my money and life savings and I'm going to go to the local TV station and show how your insecure servers are putting me at risk. I thought it looked pretty good. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was right. <laughs> So the, uh, so the next morning I send it, an hour later or less, it's like, because it's a blur to me, trust me, it's like I'm sitting in the office with the CIO, the president, and the CEO of the company who wasn't in on the joke, who was supposed to be but didn't get read in, so, you know, that was awkward. And so we're sitting there, and the CIO is going over and telling me, like, oh, we could do this, and like, oh, yeah, this, this could be an issue, yeah, you know, that, yeah, that looks bad. And then he says, well, look at this DNS who is information. Well, the DNS who is information had the name of the other guy who was in part of the prank, one of the other executives. But once again, I did a really good job of creating the DNS who is information to make it look like it was actually legitimately this guy's information. So the CEO looks at that and he goes, oh my gosh, so he's been compromised too. It's like, do we need to contact, you know? And so the CIO, you know, and me, we give that look. You know that look you give to the other guy when he gets the joke and you get the joke and you realize the other guy's not getting the joke? Yeah, we gave that look. And then the CIO had to go and tell him saying, uh, what also could be, you know, that it's April Fool's Day. <sighs> the president of the company, sitting in his chair, looks at the papers, looks up at us, stands up and says, oh, April Fool's, funny, walks out. <laughs> the good news is this was on a Friday, so I had the whole weekend to get my resume up and running and stuff, you know. So it's like, 
So I got that polished. So that was some good time. You know, it was a very productive time of me. But also Monday morning, I come in. My badge still works. Yay. And I go and talk to the president of the company. And I explain to him, it's like, by the way, even though that was like a horrible thing that we did, and thank you for not firing me yet, right? It's like uh, two alerts went off. While I was scraping the website, two IDS alerts went off. Those two IDS alerts I'd never paid attention to before. But guess what? From my IP address, from that, I was doing something bad. So where did the priority of those IDS alerts go to now? A little bit higher because I know something's going on. And so I was able to show him that. I was able to show him. I was able to talk to him about phishing and the reason why we have to have a response to that. It's like three months later, we actually had a phishing incident. After we convinced him that it wasn't us being funny, it's like we were able to enact that plan. We were able to respond to it. We were able to find out where the vulnerabilities are on the website that was hosting it. I was able to go in, explain to the web hosting people where uh, their servers were compromised, get our data off of the, their website, the, phishing, the fake site off their website, able to contact the authorities. People went to jail from that because our CEOs and executives understood exactly how important having a phishing incident response plan was because of a really bad, crappy April Fool's joke. But I created situational awareness in that, in that instance. It's like you show them there's nothing more exhilarating than being shot at without effect. That's from Winston Churchill. That's why you have pen test. That's why you have people come into your organization and try to attack you, not try to scan you, not try to assess you, but try to attack you because that helps create social, uh, social awareness. That creates what I call a high threat, low impact event. It's a high threat because you know, they could destroy your company. It's a low impact because you've hired them, they have NDAs, they have a, a code of work and a scope of work on how to do it. So you need to create those and that's the reason why you do it. It's not just to say, you know, it's like, oh, I'm not trying to say, oh, yay, pen testers, we got to do it. I'm saying it's good because it creates situational awareness for your executives if it's properly given to them. And that helps them understand. And that brings me to the next point. I am so tired of everybody saying and trying to be derogatory about executives saying, oh, yeah, just give them pie charts, you know, just give them some numbers and some pretty paper and stuff, you know, and they'll just love it. dude. If it helps secure my network, I'm giving them pie charts. If it's going to help secure my network, I'm going to make them a pie. <laughs> you know what pie charts are? They're numbers. They're metrics. There are ways for them to be able to understand all the technical stuff you're able to do. They are now able to understand that this is how many spam emails are coming into our gateway. This is how many that have virus attachments. This is how many that were filtered out. This is how many that actually went to the, uh, to the desktop user and was handled by the client side. These are how many firewall attacks came through. These are how many scores, these are how many blocks. Those are all numbers. And the more metrics you gather for your executives to put in these pie charts, guess what? Those are more metrics that you find out how your network is running. You should want metrics, you should embrace the metrics, you should love metrics because they help you find out what's going on on your network. That helps your network run better, that helps your job. And you know what else? At the end of the year, you have nice little pie charts and graphs that you can show your executives saying, this is why I need this uh, extra money in our budget. This is why it's going to help us be more secure. So get those metrics, start understanding what's going on on your network and start putting those metrics into paper in a way that an executive can read and understand and use for your benefit. Another thing, and I, I wanna say right now, it's like the Lord has never been more good to us than this last year with RSA, Northrop Drummond, LinkedIn, thank you so much, okay, because especially LinkedIn. LinkedIn was awesome because that's like the Facebook for executives. It's like they may not understand some of these other threats, but they realize, oh, my LinkedIn account, that's not good because, you know, most likely their LinkedIn account is also their network account login password. <laughs> so it's like, so, so that was a great wake up call for your executives. Every person, and you don't have to raise your hand, but every person is like, when this story came out, 
did you talk to your upper management and explain to them and send them a note saying this just happened, change your LinkedIn password, this is the reason why we have to have password policy, this is the reason why, uh, explain to them hashes and salts and let them in a way that they can understand it. Did you use that as a learning opportunity for your upper management? I sure hope so. It's like, because that's what that was. That was a gift to you to help another opportunity for you to educate. We have a week, uh, every two weeks, we have a management meeting on security. And on that agenda, the very first two things on the front page of the agenda are two news stories on information security. We've never ran, you know, two weeks without two news stories about something computer security related. So it's like, we have those two stories and that gives them something to read. Always let them know this stuff is still going on. This may not affect us, but it's still there. It creates a dialogue. It creates a way to communicate because that's what we're lacking. I don't care how awesome you are at breaking something or figuring out how something is broken. If you can't communicate to upper management, you're wasting their time. You have to learn how to communicate. And that's by a, a radical way that we have to start changing our attitudes on how we deal with it. And once again, I'm talking about me as well, because I will tell you, I had the worst, worst sheriff syndrome ever when I first started out in information security. How's it going? I'm Jason, I'm here to secure your networks and make you safe. This is what we need to do. Shut that down, shut that down, shut that down. It's like, uh, cut that out. No, we don't need freaking 80 to the desktop. What are you thinking? It's like, we need to keep it secure. You know why? Because I'm trying to do what's best for the company. You know, that's our attitude. We're there, we're the good guys. We're trying to protect you and stuff, you know, let us do it. But there's a problem with that. It's like, for one, some people need port 80. It's like, unfortunately, you know, it's like, but we've got to understand we can't be disgruntled by that. We can't lose hope. We can't get beaten down and go and say, no one's listening to us. No one's like listening to what we're trying to do. We're trying to save them. We're trying to protect them and stuff, you know, and I'm trying to protect you from yourself. And I told the CIO one time to his face, I said, look, you paid me to tell you the things you don't want to hear. That went over awesome. <laughs> It's like, you know, it's like, so I, I do this and I show them these things and that's not helping. It's like, because then that shuts down the conversation and you've got to have a conversation. You've got to be able to converse with them. You can't just lose hope with them. Because I learned, and this was a, a hard lesson to learn, but guess what? My job in information security is not to change things, not to enact change. My job is to observe and report. If I see the executive running toward the cliff, my job is not to tackle him and tell him not to run. My job is to say, dude, dude, cliff, right over there, cliff, woo -hoo. you know, big, big drop, Dover, right there. And you know what? He decides to keep running. Do I give up, walk away? Do I try to tackle him? No. What I do is I run up beside him and go, hey, dude, I, I've got this parachute, $500. If you want to invest $500, here's a parachute. You can enjoy the drop, you know? And then he's like, and by the way, you got to give him options. So here's an umbrella, $5, $5 an umbrella. It's like, you know, do some Mary Poppins, wishful thinking and stuff, you know, you might make it, you know, I'm just saying. It's like, you know, it's like, you got, you got, you got to give them that spectrum. So as they're doing that, you got to give them those choices. And then you know what happens? they keep running over and they run off the cliff, you don't get mad. You don't get frustrated, you don't get angry. That was their choice. My job, and this is one of the hardest things I ever learned, is not to eliminate risk. My job is not to eliminate risk. I can't, I'm powerless to do that. It's like I'm in an AA meeting right now, but I'm serious. I am powerless to eliminate risk. I can mitigate risk. I can show an executive how to do risk. It's like where the risks are. And that executive is going to say, here's this much money to eliminate this much risk. And then you know what he's gonna say? After you've eliminated as much risk as you can in these points, we're going to offset some risk. We're going to offset some risk with some third party vendors, with some SLAs, with some agreements, with some insurance. We're going to offset some of that risk. And then at the end of the day, they're going to say, we're going to accept this much risk. We're going to accept this much risk because, you know, we have found that we needed the internet to keep our business going. 
So we're going to have to let that keep coming in. Okay? So they're going to accept risk. We're not there to eliminate it. We're there to help mitigate it. And so we got to figure out what those risks are and what the biggest risks are and help work on those. And a lot of people like to say one of our biggest risks is the employee. <laughs> Brings us to our next point. <laughs> well, y'all chuckle, I'm going to chug. That works. Yes, it does. <laughs> one of the biggest phrases I hate, I loathe. Stupid user. Stupid user clicked on a link. Stupid user went to a website. Stupid user opened up an email. Stupid information security didn't properly train their employees. That's what I say. We need to understand that if a guy starts on day one without a driver's license and we give him the keys to the company van and ask him to do a quick delivery and he crashes it, whose fault is that? You, you would like to. Yeah, you'd like to. It's just like in Star Wars, who's the greater fool? The fool or the one who follows them? It's like we're the ones that empowered them, we're the ones that gave them the tools, and then we're surprised when that outcome happens. So we need to start understanding it's not stupid users. It's uneducated users. It's uneducated employees. Because I guarantee you one important thing. You take Solitaire off a desktop, you see how quick they get that sucker back. Those suckers can be creative when they're motivated. <laughs> they know how to do that. You, you block Facebook on the website through a proxy to see how fast that happens. I was at a DC214 meeting. I kid you not, there was a guy I'd never seen before. The only reason why he was there was he was trying to uh, figure out the hackers to show them how to get past uh, the proxy so he could get back on Facebook. <laughs> he researched on the web looking for a local hacker group so he could go and get information and intel. <laughs> Is that a stupid employee? No. So they can be educated. They understand. The problem is they don't understand all the problems they're facing. And we're not, we're not educating them in the right way. Okay? Knocking them upside the head doesn't seem to work too much. I've tried it. The, you know, the court case is still pending, so I'm not going to talk about it. Okay? But, but it's there. We have to understand how to approach the education. Users, your employees are still getting compromised at home. Their children are talking to people you don't understand who they're talking to on their Facebook and on their websites. You don't know where they're going to. They don't know who they're giving that information out to on eBay. They can't protect their own stuff, their own information, their own money, their own online accounts. How the heck do they, you expect them to understand and care about your data to protect it? Stop trying to educate employees to be better workers and, and protecting customer data. Start teaching your employees how to be good computer users and protect themselves at home. Show them how to protect their home data. Do a course on how to protect their home Wi-Fi setup and the dangers of a home Wi-Fi that's totally open or using web. So show them those kind of things. Show them how to be able to uh, keep better track of their children online and what they're doing online. Do a security awareness course on that. Show them how to protect themselves. Show them how to be good, secure thinking users at home. And guess what? They bring that to work. They bring that attitude at work because they still don't care about your data. But now they've got that habit of protecting themselves, and so they're just naturally going to protect themselves when they come to work. We have to start doing that. We can't just try to teach them on a little web-based click that they're supposed to care about where they memorize the words. They've got to understand how it impacts them, how they're invested in it. And you do that by bringing it home to them, literally. We also have to understand we need to start empowering our employees. They've got to be empowered. You can't just say, you know, do as I say, do as I told. We got to start showing them that there's a way that we're watching. One of the things that we like to do is when someone comes up to me, it's like if they catch me or when I'm doing a regular engagement or something like that, it's a big deal. It's like, oh, great job. You're doing a great job. 
on our day-to-day -day job, when I see someone who won't let someone walk in through the uh, behind them piggyback, they get a notice in our, in our newsletter. So uh, one lady found a USB drive, human hacker, I'm looking at you. It's like in the parking lot and it's like, and she didn't, she didn't turn it on. She didn't open it up. She didn't click stuff. She handed it into security immediately. We had a whole profile story of her explaining exactly what she was thinking, what she was doing and put that out there. And you know what that does? That gets people angry because you don't got Bob in the county going, that effing Susie. She's always on the freaking, she's doing the United Way. She's got the, you know, the cure for cancer walk over here. She's always getting the attention and stuff. You know, now she's like finding USB drives that she didn't plan them or there so she can get attention in the newsletter. You know, what I can do, I can freaking stop someone from coming behind me. I'll get someone from clicking something. It's like, I can get in the newsletter too. And you start the competition of trying to do things good. You, you, basically, I'm trying to tell you social engineer your employees so they're protected against social engineering, okay? <laughs> it's like, show them these things. It's like you have to be able to educate them and keep them understanding where these kind of threats are. And of course, sometimes that's not always <laughs> negative enforcement. It's like there is, there is such a thing as positive enforcement as well. It's like by doing things like that. But also, there's another thing that we do and every, I kid you not, at least once a year, every floor of every building that we own in every state that we own it, we will walk through, secure, information security will walk through that whole floor, and what we're doing is we're picking up keyboards. We're looking under the keyboards. And I will tell you honestly, when we first started, we were finding them, okay? So we look under the keyboards, we look around the desk, and people ask what you're doing. I said, like, we're, we're doing it. We're looking sure there's no key, uh, passwords under the keyboards. We find those every once in a while. It's a security thing. It's like we're just trying to keep a clean environment. What does that do besides, you know, make them uh, remind them that they got a dust under their keyboard? It reinforces that too. It makes them hide it better. And we've, we've progressed and stuff, you know, on how we, we do the searches. But it also makes them understand information security is not you know some untangible you know group out there in the ether there are real people that will come to your desk there's actually a real world impact on something that you talk about on the computer they start associating that and they understand when something like that happens another thing is we have email filtering on our exchange it's like if you try to send an executable and i kid you not the solitaire thing is a real thing. We got a lot of solitaires being sent over the email. It's like uh, at first, and you know what would happen there? I'm at your desk. Excuse me, I'm information security. I need you to get up out of your chair and I need you to stand over here, please. It's like, thank you, I need to sit down. And I start bringing up stuff. I start looking through things. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm like, just, I might as well have just been, you know, checking my email. I'm just like rambling, just walking through stuff. But you know what I'm doing? He has to stand there looking at me and stuff, you know, trying not to look at it. all the other people around him looking at him and stuff, you know, while I'm looking at his computer. As soon as I stand up, it's like, do you understand our computer policy, use policy? Do you understand that we're not allowed to send any executables to the, uh, the email system? Are you understanding these e emails and stuff, you know, these kind of attachments, you know, could be harmful to our network and that's the reason why they shouldn't be sent out. Do you understand that? Do you need a new copy of the computer use policy? I will be happy to send that to you. Do you have that? You do, thank you. Well then I hope you, we want to see this again. Thank you, I'm done. It's like, and then I walk out. I didn't just educate him. I educated the five or six people around him. I educated the, you know, the 20 people that they hear, heard about that on, on the water cooler. I heard about like the other 50 that got it posted on Facebook. It's like that message goes out and they understand real world consequences from something that they do on the computer. This stuff actually translates to in real life. You have to start creating that kind of enforcement. You have to start becoming approachable. You have to start learning how to understand and interact with your users. So we've understood, we've got to learn better how to be better at interacting with our upper management. It's just not their fault if they don't know how to communicate. We understand how we better have to better communicate with our users because sometimes we're not the greatest at communicating to them. Well, we also have to start understanding how to better communicate amongst ourselves. Okay, there's another thing that we have to worry about and stuff, you know, when we're dealing with, you know, the information security industry. We've got some issues, and this is the popular part. It's like, uh, because I see information security right now is this. This is the way I see it. You got the industry right here. 
90% of the people are in the information security industry. You know what they do? They get up, they go to work at nine o'clock, they punch out at five o'clock, and they go home to those uh, family unit things, uh, children and spouses and stuff, and they'll do things with them that you're supposed to do, which makes me a horrible father and a lousy husband. But they do that stuff because this isn't their passion. This isn't something that drives them. This is their paycheck. This is their job. And we thank them for that because this internet wouldn't be running without them. They're doing the work and they're just trying to get a paycheck. That's what they do. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's like, but you know what? We need more here in the community. Guess what? Welcome to the community. You're here. You're trying to learn. You're trying to bring something back because you're in, uh, power and passionate about it. You like learning about this stuff. You like, you'll, you'll write a blog post or you'll write something or you'll do research and you'll give a talk at a conference. That's where everybody should be is in the community. We need to start getting that thinking out there and stuff, you know, it's like that you have something to contribute. Because we got this one little piece right here, the pimple on the butt crack of the industry right here, which is the scene. And guess who was in the scene? That'd be me. I was there for a while. It's like, you know, it's like I was more concerned and stuff, you know, about how people saw me or what I was doing and stuff, you know, and just being around at the conferences, I didn't understand how to do the communication, how to do something, so you know, talk to people and try to build something up. It was just about making sure people saw that I was standing next to, you know, HD or Dan Kaminsky and stuff, you know, with blue hair and stuff, you know, riding a Segway. That's where that stuff was. And that was my mistake and that's what I did wrong. Because that's not where it's at. We need to get more people into the community. We need to get that industry area to shrink and that community size to grow and, you know, we need the scene just the GTFO. So that's what needs to happen. It's like, and there's different ways to do it, but we need to come to an understanding about, and I like this because I was doing searches for, you know, rock stars, and Henry Rollins, if you don't know, is a singer from Black Flag. It's like a Henry Rollins band. He is a poet. He is an author. He is an artist. And yes, he was that guy that played in Johnny Mnemonic. Mnemonic. Yeah, he's that guy. So listen to the stage manner and get on stage when they tell you to. No one has the time for your rock star BS. None of the techs backstage care if you're David Bowie or the milkman. When you act like a jerk, they're completely unimpressed with the, your infantile display that you might think comes with your dubious status. They were here hours before you building the stage and they'll be here hours after you leave tearing it down. They should get your salary and you should get theirs. That brings up one important point, uh, uh, another thing that I think about. When I see something like that, I think about David Lee. Not David Lee Roth, I know we're talking about music here. David Lee was doing his uh, patrol in Tampa one night. He sees a car in his regular area and stuff he has never seen before. He runs the plates, the car stolen. Gets the guy out, wrestles with him, maintains control of his gun barely, and gets the guy in custody. That guy was Ted Bundy. We know Ted Bundy. Why don't we know David Lee? You know why? He was doing his job. That's what he was doing. He wasn't creating, you know, he wasn't thinking about how awesome this was gonna be at his next, you know, police convention and stuff, you know, to be able to talk about catching Ted Bundy. He wasn't waiting for a booking on Oprah. You know what he did the next day? He went back out on patrol and did his job. What about, you know, uh, Robert Rolf and Rolf Mueller? No, they're not techno guys from Berlin. It's like, you know what those guys were? They were doing a patrol in a really bad neighborhood. They see a guy come up to them, an African-American, naked in a handcuff dangling off his wrist. And you know what they do? They don't just, you know, throw him up against the car, think he's doing some kind of drug or something, you know, and arrest him. They listen to him. They figure out what's going on. They listen to his story and they go to check it out. And that's when they arrested Jeffrey Dahmer. But we don't know about those guys. We know about Jeffrey Dahmer, but we don't know about those two guys, right? Because they were doing their job. There are guys out there like that every day doing their job, saving lives, but that's not the sexy stuff. That's not the cool stuff. That's not, you know, what gets you going to conferences. 
It's like we need to understand our perspective in this. Jonas Falk, not the Jonas Brothers, you know, he's a cool guy. We all thank him. Every single one of us, you know, really appreciates his work. Exactly. He cured polio. We appreciate and we benefit from his work. So yes, the things that you do matter. The things that you do help everyone. The things that you do impact the world in great ways. Thank you for that. And then keep doing it. Don't do it for the accolades, do it because it's right. Do it because it's what's supposed to be done. Do it because you're a good guy, not because you might get accepted by a CFP. That's where we have to start thinking this stuff because there's so many people out there that have information to contribute. And this is one of the things that gets me the most is seeing so many people out there. And I've had people come up to me and say, you know, it's like, yeah, I, I've got something to say, but I don't know what people are going to say about it. You know, I don't know if people are going to like what I have to say. It's like, you know, I don't know if I'm going to get, you know, because I mean, we, we have to understand there's a lot of that. There's a lot of people out there willing to tell you how you're doing something wrong. It's like, and that can bear you down. I will tell you one of the things that happened to me less than two hours ago was I had a guy that I was sitting in a talk. It's like, and he, come, he leans over before the talk and he says that he saw one of my vidcasts and I, I inspired him to start, you know, getting more involved in the community and, and doing more research. Because he saw that and he had that, that same kind of problems that I was talking about and he wanted to do more. I am never going to build a program that's going to help your job better. It's like, I'm not a red team ninja. I am not, you know, some kind of social engineering guru wizard. I'm not even an APT unicorn, okay? <laughs> I'm just a guy who's just trying to do the best that I can do. And if I only, my only accomplishment in this industry is I've helped other people realize that they can contribute more, I've done a pretty freaking good job. And I'm happy for that. Because that's what it's about, is trying to start building out this community. Because there are too many people sitting in that audience and not standing up on this stage after me and giving a talk. We need more of you to understand that you have something to contribute. Start doing it. Because I am tired of, go you know where I learned most of my stuff? It's not from hearing someone up here on the stage. It's talking to some of the attendance people and talking to them and having conversations and learning and building off of that. Y'all all have something to contribute. Contribute it. Don't worry about people talking about, about it. Don't worry about, you know, thinking that you're going to make a mistake. I, I have made a career on making mistakes, people. And I'm still here because I'm still doing it. It's not about how many mistakes you make. Do you keep after it and learn from it and do better? You hear someone that gives a talk and you go and say, man, I, I, didn't, really I didn't really agree with what he had to say. There was this other whole aspect and stuff. You know, that, give a talk on it. Do more research. Share it with people. I want to hear from you. People are talking about there's too many conferences around. There's not enough. I want more local conferences. I want to hear from more local speakers. I want to hear from the people that aren't contributing. I want to hear from them. I want to see that involvement. You've got DEF CON groups. You've got 2600 groups. You've got ISSA groups, InfraGuard groups. You've got local places that you can give a talk on and learn. It's the internet. Why don't you already have a blog like the other 5 million people talking about, you know, what they had for dinner? It's like, contribute. It's like start sharing that information. And you know what else? When you're sharing that information, someone else is going to come up and say, hey, you know what? I'm working on something just like that. It's like, let's collaborate. Let's start making it better. It's like, so please, if there's anything that I can tell you right now is that we need more activity from the community. DerbyCon, and one of the things that's so special for me was because of the fact that I see people just down there in the lobby and they're just talking. It doesn't matter what color your freaking badge is, it's like you can have a conversation. So one of the reasons was I, I love, I mean, I started the, the awkward hug movement, you know, totally just, you know, because someone, you know, Tonkoff wasn't able to make it somewhere and then it just grew. But you know what I discovered? People approached me more. People talked to me more. 
And that's, that is not something from you guys. That's something I appreciated. I want to be stopped at any time and stuff, you know, and have someone give me an awkward hug, like someone have a conversation with me. It's like, that's why I come to these things. I come here to learn, not from just the speakers. I come to learn from the people that are in the audience. So I want to start hearing you guys and sharing that information and understanding that y'all can talk to each other, awkward hug each other. It's like start understanding that the more y'all get involved collectively, the bigger this community grows. So just don't do it for me. Just don't do it for the awkward hugs. Do it for the community. Do it because it's the right thing to do and do it because you know, you're good guys. So that's about it on that one. I, I avoided crying, so I'm very happy about that. It's like uh... Any questions? And I, I really have no problem there's not any questions because I'm going to be here for the whole conference. Feel free to talk to me in the lobby or, or come up with me and, and, and talk about it or get an awkward hug. Yes? Do all of your users uh, buy into your mold protection plan? I mean, yeah, you know, it's great that, you know, it's Susie and John and Jim for using it, but I mean, you guys are the ones who are going to be Oh, I've, oh, I get a lot of people angry with me, you know, it's like, have you seen my Twitter feed? It's like, yeah, that's like, that's like I, I've irritated a lot of people, but no, but when it comes to the work environment, you're going to have people that are disgruntled with it and, and aren't going to be happy about it. And that's just the price of being protected. It's like, you need to, if you can't show, there's some people, no matter how bad you show them, they're, they're going to be infected or they're going to bring something down. You're still going to go and have that guy and stuff, you know, Oh, yeah, but let me push that button anyway, and then boom, you see them on the Darwin Awards, okay? That's still going to happen. But the whole thing is, is you're trying to educate as much as you can and protect against the, the ones that, that won't learn. Yes? I don't think that's ever going to unfortunately happen. I don't know if that could happen because it's like, I mean, you've got, and I've heard from, there's an, I was talking to an auditor on an engagement and they're talking about, they go to auditor conferences and there's like, you know, three or four auditors and stuff, you know, they're like, I'm that speaker, you know, I'm that, I mean, they're, they're in every industry. Okay. So you're, you're not going to, I mean, it's like, you've got some guy who's like the foremost dental technologist and stuff, you know, on braces and stuff, you know, and he is the crap, you know, it's like, I'm the guy, you know, that's just going to happen. But you, what you do is just start understanding and calling, I mean, it's not even about calling them out, it's just paying attention more to the other people. It's like, I mean, it's just basically, it's just a call to see who's doing it. It's like, I've distanced myself from people I think that are like, that are acting like that. And I just try to associate with people that are just trying to learn. I'm coming up to anybody that wants to talk, and I'm gonna to talk to them. And I've seen other people that are like, you know, they're in their little entourage and they're not to be bothered with. And you know what? I'm not going to bother them. It's like there's plenty of other people that I can talk to. It's like, I mean, it, I've learned last night, I kid you not, it's like I'm sitting out in the lobby chilling out. HD showed me some really cool trick with TrueCrypt that I didn't know. It's like, I mean, just boom. It's like it wasn't part of a talk. It wasn't part of it. was just something that he uses. And I was like, he was able to show it. And it wasn't like, it's like it was just he was hanging out with the whole group of people. And it's just he was doing something. And he showed it. That knowledge that I can use, I'm taking that back and working with it. It's like, and that's something that you can go and say, say, oh yeah, there was another thing and someone else brought up something else. Do you think we'll be able to change the nine to five from the two parts of the community? Yes, and we do that through, the way that you get the industry more involved in the community is by actually sharing this kind of information at local places. Because they'll go to ISSA meetings because they'll get their CPEs for their CISSP. You know, they'll, they'll go to their ISACA meetings, they'll go to their InfraGuard meetings, they'll go to those kind of meetings. Huh? 
Exactly. They, they will, they, a, a lot of the industry people go to lunch and learns because, I mean, hey, free hamburger. It's like, so it's like, educate them there. Show them there's something else besides what that is. Invite them to a 2600 meeting, invite them to a DC meeting, show them a different website to go to. The reason why I created dissectingthehack.com was not, you know, because it's like I wanted people to go out and get a book. It's like there's nowhere on there is about the book. It's a community for people who don't have a place to blog. There's a place for them to blog there. There's no advertisements. I don't sell anything. I spend money on that site every month because I just want it to be a place where someone who hasn't, doesn't have any other place to, to put a blog post or, or put something out there, they have a, a flame-free zone that they can start sharing that information. And I've had several people that have created blog posts and then have gone on to give talks and stuff, you know, from that site. And it's just there for the community. It's not there for me. Yes. Yes. My most humbling and learning in InfoSec or from an InfoSec related thing? Uh, in relation to everything, you're talking about. everything I think one of the biggest things and one of the biggest things that put, that just brought me down to earth and cradled me and stuff, you know, it's like, and I do not run from my mistakes. It's like, I am totally honest about them was my book problem. It's like, uh, it's like I wrote a book. It's like I had a, I had a, I mean, I poured my heart into it. I've been trying to get it published for like four or five years. It's like I finally get a, a, a signed contract and then they wanted everything else in the rest of the month, which is sort of bad because we only had four chapters because we didn't expect you know, anybody to actually be you know, picking it up. And so it's like, so now we're scrambling and we had a whole technical side that needed to be written. So I get someone to help me out with that. It's like, and he said he had a whole team. His whole team was Wikipedia. <laughs> Turns out to be not a, not a great thing. And so, and I kid you not, I can tell you the exact moment. I am driving home from a DC 405 meeting. I have a, it took me, because I was driving home with a box of donuts. It was a Friday night. I was bringing home a box of donuts for the family. I didn't eat donuts for at least six months after that. That's how bad the negative connotation was. It's like, so I go home, I get to the house. It's like, I bring up my computer, I bring up my Twitter, and there's a report talking about how the book was plagiarized. That was one of the worst moments in my whole entire life. I've had cancer and that's above cancer, having that situation. It's like, that was one of the worst things that have ever happened to my, and I've been homeless. I mean, I've had some pretty bad things. I've got a good gauge on what bad things are, okay? So trust me when I say that was up there. From the technical side, it's uh, being wrong. That, I mean, everybody has that. I go up and I tell someone at, at work, and I'm telling them, he's like, hey, we've got to shut down. The, there's one big one. I created a fuss because I see these trace routes and stuff, you know, the, uh, not trace, I don't know at the time. I see these UDP uh, ports scanning our internal segments, and they're coming from internal routers. Oh, my effing God, we're compromised. It's like bring out the red alerts and stuff, you know, and the air sirens and stuff, you know, and duck and cover. So I go around, I'm getting people involved, I'm getting network over here, I'm getting these people, like, this is an incident, we need to take care of it, and I'm here to clean it up, let's go, let's get this going. So I get so busy trying to get all this information and trying to get the top level guys in, I make the mistake of not actually asking the rest of the networking guys what they're doing. Because they're just the networking guys, I'm not communicating properly, I make that mistake. And one of the other networking guys was doing a UDP trace route from one of the routers trying to test the, the throughput. <laughs> so we find that out and CIO standing above me. My boss is right there. It's like, you know, the manager of the networking is right there. And Jason, did you ask all the other guys uh, what, what they were doing first? Obviously not. <laughs> it's like, it's like, I mean, I'm, no, it's like, uh, and I took that lump and I had people making jokes about it, you know, to this day. It's like, uh, so it's like, but that happens. But it's not the fact that you make mistakes. It's the fact that you learn from it and you keep going. I mean, there has been times where I have like just wanted, I mean, there has been times seriously in this industry with some of the critiques that I've gotten from people, and some people that I'm like, I will see all the good things people say about me. And I'm going, oh, that's cool. And that one guy comes out and says like something that negative on a podcast or he says it and stuff, you know, to my face. And I'm like, oh, my God, why am I still doing this? 
It's like, I have horrible self-esteem. I do not really think I'm that big of a deal. I'm a freaking guy who's just trying to learn, who's a fanboy just like everybody else, who just wants to do the best I can. It amazes me people even come to my talks because it's not technical, it's not shaping anything. I'm just trying to share information. So, 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 <laughs> exactly. So there, so there it goes. That's the reason why it is. And now they're telling me that I've actually made all my time. So um, if there's any other questions, like I said, guys, please meet me afterwards. Meet me in the lobby. Let's talk.